And hello again, this is A.W. Anthony Mays, Senior Pastor of the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church here in the city of Austin, Texas, welcoming you and thanking you for tuning in to our Bible study session that we send out each Monday evening broadcast at 7 p.m. We invite you to the Mount Sinai Baptist Church if you're in the city and would like to worship with us in person. Our address is 8500 Cameron Road on the north side of the city. It's easy, it's convenient for you to get to us and share with us in person worship. We're still following the CDC guidelines, have temperature screening, screening as you enter into the building, basic information, uh, we ask that you wear your mask while in the building, and we pray that uh, God continues to give us covering. Uh, we're physically distancing so that we can uh, yet do this safely, and God has granted us that. And we want to invite you as well to discover the ministry of the Mount Sinai Church. We lovingly call it the Mount. Check us out on the website, World Wide Web, www.themount.net. Make that all as one word, T-H-E-M-O-U-N-T, themount.net. And if you wish to communicate directly with us, Pastor Mays, the email address through the church is Pastor A. W. Mays at themount.net. We welcome your comments. We welcome your question. Anything that we can do to be of service to you, we make ourselves available. This is our time together in Bible study. And in Bible study, I encourage all of us to know that we seek to know more of God's Word. We seek to become better students of God's Word. And I believe that this can be accomplished in one manner through Bible study. And so in our Bible study, we have a three-part strategy, three-fold strategy, three-phase study of God's Word. Of course, in preparation uh, we urge and exhort that you would pray. When you come to God's Word, recognize it is expected that you will prepare your heart, your soul, your spirit through prayer. What are you praying? You're praying, God, open my eyes. Lord, give me understanding. Lord, cause me to see what you want me to have from your word, prepare my heart that your seed might find a resting place in good soil. And then here's the first step. Here is the first part of our Bible study strategy, and that is reading. Reading for yourself, reading the text, reading the scripture passage, reading the verse. Make sure that you are reading it as it is written. Reading it accurately and deliberately is the challenge that you must come to. And I encourage you to read it again. Read it twice. Read it three times. The Word of God is yet new and the Word of God is fresh. And it is so important that you read the Word of God accurately. Every English Bible that we have, every Bible that's in Spanish, every Bible that's in French, any Bible other than the original writings of Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic is a result of a translation. And there are many translations that are available. Uh, some of them are quite good and they're more modern and they will not cause you to stumble because of the very ancient language of King James, which across the years we've 
begun to hold it in our hearts as religious language and church language. But we would have us to know that every English Bible is translation. And so therefore, someone has worked to bring into English what would be the original writings. And so uh, most Christians as laypersons are not uh, able to go directly, but there are study helps that can help a person um, understand more clearly uh, from the original writings that have been translated into English. Read it. Read it. It gives you information. Read it. It, it, it gives you data. Read it. It, it. it says things to us. But then the second step, after reading carefully, is interpretation. Analyzing. Discovering the meaning of what it is that we've read. Very often in our Bible study, I would use the very simple illustration of lights, traffic lights at a controlled intersection. The three colors in this country that uh, we normally would see, and that is red, um, green, and yellow. Red, green, and yellow. We can see the illumination of those traffic signals but then the second step is that those colors, those lights, have meaning. That's the interpretation. It's red. It means stop. It is green. It means go. It is yellow. It is a warning that it is about to change. And whatever that you're doing, do it quickly and do it safely as best you can. What thou doest, do quickly. Well, we bring that understanding to the Word of God. I know what it says, but the second step, I then must determine what it means. And this is the critical juncture of Bible study. And this is my answer and my response when persons ask, if everyone is reading the same Bible, if everyone has the same scripture that they go from, how is it that churches are so different and that denominations come in and they're very different one from the other. Well, it has to do with interpretation. It has to do with emphasis. And so we want to be very careful that we are interpreting the word we read accurately. And we want to make sure we are discovering what is in the word rather than carelessly trying to place things into the word that come from tradition, that come from our minds, that come from our thoughts. What actually is the word saying? And if you are a new believer, if you're starting out and you would like to have hands on a beginning Bible resource, get yourself a good study Bible. Purchase a study Bible. It's going to cost a little more money than a Bible that's a gift Bible that only has the scriptures because there's so much information in a study Bible. You have charts, you have diagrams, you have pictures, uh, you have introduction to chapters, you have outlines, you have headings, you have footnotes, you have cross-references, you may have articles. You may also have concordance. You may also have a dictionary. Um, many study Bibles are very helpful that if you're going to carry just one book, I suggest that you carry a one-volume study Bible that has both the Old Testament and the New Testament together, an entire Bible, uh, but it's a study Bible and you'll benefit from it. Uh, the third is very straightforward, and that is Put the Word of God in practice. Learn to live in the Word. Learn to walk in the Word of God. Well, those are the three steps, and we're getting ready to go into the book called 1 Kings. 1 Kings, and tonight we're going to begin in chapter 12. Chapter 12. Get your scripture. Get your Bibles. Look with us at 1 Kings chapter 12. 
Let's have prayer together as we prepare our hearts to look into God's word. Heavenly Father, our God, bless us now as we come to your word. Prepare our hearts, prepare our minds, prepare our spirits, make all receptible, receptive, excuse me, receptive to your word. Bless us in your word. Let your word give light to us to give us guidance as we move through this world. Bless and keep, we do pray, in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. When you read historical books of the Bible, such as 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, you get a lot of history, and you're getting a lot of national history as we have walked from Samuel to the first king, uh, Saul to the succeeding king, David, to the next king, who's Solomon, who's David's son, and the impact upon the nation. Well, we're looking at the fact that Solomon, in all of his wisdom, has, in his old age, has a heart that has drifted from God. Uh, we learned in reading and studying about Solomon, he began to have a heart for strange women, and that translation would say women of different nations. In fact, nations that God had specifically warned do not marry into these nations, do not intermarry, do not give your sons to marry their daughters, do not take their daughters uh, in this uh, relationship, because here's the thing, it's not about race. It is about religion. It's about faith. Whether those, those persons uh, are believers in Jehovah or they have a false god. And as it turned out, Solomon was persuaded by his many wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines, that they turned his heart away from loyalty to Jehovah and they began to erect pagan altars and shrines and led the people of God into sin and God brought judgment. And the judgment that was brought, of course, goes back to David and David's family, but it also said for Solomon's behavior, the kingdom is going to be split, going to be divided, that Solomon was going to lose the kingdom, but not in his time. Not while he lived, but his son, who would succeed him, would uh, uh, experience division. Let's look at chapter 12. And perhaps if you've been in and around church, you're familiar with the story, this history, as it relates to Israel. The son of Solomon, his name is Rehoboam, Rehoboam. And it says in verse 1, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. So this is going to be, Solomon has died, and the people are going to recognize and accept Rehoboam at Shechem to be their king. And verse 2 says, And it came to pass when Jeroboam, a former servant to Solomon in that house he had grown up, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. This is one of those uh, likening the experience to uh, some nations where leaders go into exile. They distance themselves from their nation and they live in another nation in exile. And so Jeroboam, who has fled from Solomon, who literally tried to kill him, but God had protected him. Now Jeroboam 
who's not the son of Solomon, Jeroboam, hears that um, there's been a change. Solomon is dead. The one that sought his life is now dead. Verse 3, and so it is that they sent and called him, that is Israel. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam. They want a meeting. They want to come before the king at Shechem. And here is the speaking unto Rehoboam. Surely there's a spokesperson and then these people are standing around in support of what the spokesperson is saying. Verse 3, uh, verse 4, excuse me. Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke which he put upon us lighter and we will serve thee. Here's the proposition. Under your father and all of this great glory of the kingdom, he taxed us. He demanded of us high taxes to support his kingdom. And we're saying to you as a beginning king, if you lighten the load, if you will um, decrease the burden that we bear, then we will serve you. Verse 5, this is a heavy decision. And Rehoboam said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me, and the people departed. So, very plainly, uh, Rehoboam hears their word, but he said, Let me think it over. Give me three days uh, that I might have counsel about what you're asking. Here is the popular story. They left him, and verse 6, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men. You can underline that in your Bibles if you want to notice. He's talking to experienced men. Men that, verse 6 says, That stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived. He's coming to those who have shared in the administration of his father Solomon. And he calls them old men. That's because uh, they're not new to this experience. And he asked them, how do you advise that I may answer this people? What counsel would you give to me? And so verse 7 these are the old men. They spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant, underline that if you would, a servant unto this people, a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them. You're king, but you're king to serve the people. To serve the people and will serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. They've come to you. They've made this petition unto you. These old men in wisdom say that if you recognize that you are a servant and if you recognize that you need to speak good words unto them, certainly not harsh words, then they will serve you in return. Verse 18, But, and I say in Bible study, whenever you come across the word but, recognize it's a signal word. It is a signal word. It's a word of reversal. He has heard what the old man in their counsel has said. Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel of the old man. He didn't accept it. He rejected it, which they had given him. And here he goes. He consulted with the young men 
that were grown up with him and which stood before him. He rejected the wise counsel of these elderly leaders who have served under Solomon. He rejects it all together and he turns to the young men for counsel. And there are some wise young people, but generally these people in their youth do not have the experience, do not have the years of trial, of watching, of learning that comes with time. And he said, verse 9, and he said unto them, what counsel, he's talking to the young men, give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken unto me, saying, make the yoke which thy father did put up on us lighter. So he's turned now to those who grown up with him, who have not gone any further down the road than what he has gone down the road. Be careful of this, especially I want to say to our young persons, be careful of getting your advice from inexperienced youth. Verse 10, and the young men that were grown up, this is the second time the scripture said it, that had grown up with him, spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, here is the word, tell them, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, this is what you shall say to them, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. In other words, you thought it was heavy under my father, and you haven't seen anything yet. Verse 11, And now whereas my father did laid you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke, my father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. This is what they are telling Rehoboam to tell these people. In other words, I would interpret the counsel is make them know that you're in charge. Make them know that you are now the king. Make them to know that you will have and exercise more power even than what your father did. That they should not come seeking to take advantage of your youthfulness. That it's going to be something for you to know how my administration will be toward you. And so, verse 12, So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. That's a rehearsing of what their agreement was. And so it's after three days, and they have come back according to what the king designated to hear his answer. Verse 13, And the king, that is Rehoboam, answered the people roughly, and again, it says, forsook, rejected the old men's counsel that they gave him. And verse 14, spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. This is the exact opposite of what the old men had told him to do, speak good words. But the young, arrogant men of his generation, I guess to impress that Rehoboam is the king, tells, them, tells him to speak to them in a very rough manner. Verse 15, Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord. Underline this. For the cause was from the Lord that he might perform his saying which 
the Lord spake by Ahijah the Shilonite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. In other words, all of this before us is being directed by the Lord because the Lord has given his word of prophecy and he is now bringing to pass circumstances and situations that his word would be realized. In other words, he promised through this prophet Ahijah that there would be a split in the nation, a division. There would be a breaking of unity. So verse 16, playing out what God had predicted and prophesied. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. This is how you would want to know in the Bible, how did there become two nations? How did there become a northern nation and a southern nation? How did there become the nation called Israel of the north and Judah to the south? It is right here at the succeeding to the throne of Solomon. The people are rejecting Solomon's son named Rehoboam. Verse 17. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah... Rehoboam re reigned over them. So he still maintains leadership over the loyal tribe of Judah, where Jerusalem is, and also the small tribe of Benjamin will learn. Verse 18, Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones. That is, Rehoboam sent this man, Adoram, to go and collect the taxes and go and collect what is called tribute money from these people. He doesn't understand what uh, circumstances are abiding. And Israel stoned him with stones that he died. They killed him. They stoned him to death. Therefore, King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. Remember, they're at Shechem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. That moment, there is the realization of the splitting of the kingdom and the refusal to pay tribute to Rehoboam and his kingdom. So much so that the collector was stoned to death. And Rehoboam realized how dangerous it was for him. And so he flees for safety to Jerusalem. Verse 20. And when it came to pass, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel, there was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. I also say we're going to have Benjamin to also be loyal. And so Jeroboam has been crowned as the new popular king over this breakaway nation and people. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin. There it is, with the tribe of Benjamin, and hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Rehoboam is 
planning to raise up an army of warriors, of fighters, that he will not peacefully accept the breaking away. He's going to prepare for battle. But, verse 22, But the word of God came unto Shimeiah, the man of God, the prophet, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin. Remember, I told you it's two tribes. And to the remnant of the people, saying, here's what he says. This is from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house. For this thing is from me. In other words, if you fight against this, you're going to be fighting against God because this is something God has orchestrated. And he's orchestrated this because of the sin and rebellion that was practiced under Solomon. And here's the fruit of that. Here's the fruit of that circumstance. So this is uh, from the Lord, and so they are not to fight against them. And the last verses, the last statements of verse 24, they hearkened therefore to the word of the Lord and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. In other words, Shemaiah shared the message of God. This is not a time to fight. This is not a time to go to war because this is something that I put in place. It is not good strategy to fight against what God has established. You cannot conquer God. And at least they accepted this as the word of God and they departed and they went home again. And so we have now, the division has come to pass. And that it is the word of God that has come to pass that is realized in this. Well, our time is about out and I want you to mark, if you would, in your Bibles, we're going to come to verse 25 of this 12th chapter, the next time that we gather, to deal with how this new nation, this rebellious nation against the house of David is going to uh, be manifest. So, until we come together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you is our prayer.